Hello, Internet. All right. Let's get this show going. I have got lots to talk about, lots to do today. Um, in case you're new to this channel or this show, my name is Brett, and this is my, ch my show, my channel. Every Thursday, 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. I think that's UTC minus five right now. Um, and I take your questions on Docker, Compose, Kubernetes, Container Tools, DevOps. I focus almost exclusively, uh, exclusively on cloud native container tooling. And that means all those tools I mentioned. And it also means other things like the clouds and things like Terraform and a lot of YAML, which is what Compose uses. And when I first started using Compose, I realized very quickly that it was going to be my favorite tool uh, other than Docker. Like it is the way I use Docker on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't type tons of Docker commands, right? I'm, I'm usually working in projects using YAML and typing Docker Compose commands, which is what it is designed to do. In fact, if you go back, if you go back in time, Compose wasn't, the idea wasn't created by Docker, the company. They were focused on the Docker engine and the Docker command line and another little project of which I'm forgetting, forgetting the name of the original, what, what, what it was called before Compose. Maybe somebody in chat will remember. Uh, there's probably somebody out there that remembers the original project. And then Docker took it on and, oh man, it's on the tip of my tongue, the name of it. Anyway, Docker took on the Compose project. It was written in Python and has been keeping it up to date ever since. We're now on version 27, actually 28. I think 28 just got released or is still in pre-release. We'll, we're going to check that out today. And in the last year, tons has changed for Compose. Formats have changed. Versions have changed. New tools have come out. Um, there's a new spec standard that, Do that Docker's released that's going to allow an ecosystem to adopt these tools. And we're already starting to see some of that. So I want to go through that. We've, we've actually done several things over the last year with Compose in special shows talking about Compose and specific features of it. Today, I want to step back a minute and talk about where we were, where we are, and hopefully where we're going with Compose, and then ask, answer your questions. So ask your questions about Compose. YAML, why aren't you using Compose every day? Like, why isn't it your favorite Docker tool? It should be. Um, I prefer it over running Kubernetes locally. It's more efficient. It just runs better. So let's talk about it. Let's look at the comments here. Let's see what's going on in the comments. Hello, everyone. Hello, David. Hello from the Netherlands. Hello, hello. Compose can't be used in prod. Well, it can, and lots of people do, but you probably shouldn't because it doesn't have multi-server awareness and a few other little weirdness things that it might do related to environment variables. Um, but yeah, it also doesn't respond to health checks. It doesn't store secrets encrypted. It doesn't do lots of things that you want Swarm or Kubernetes to do for you but it technically can be used. Lots of people do use it. It's just not something I recommend. And if you take any of my courses, I definitely talk about not using Compose in production a lot. Um, I actually have a whole page on that, which we should, we should put on the list of things to talk about. Uh, Compose in production. Is it, is it Compose? Yeah, Compose or Swarm. So if you're uh, curious about Compose in production, the Docker Compose, Compose command line tool, the Docker dash Compose command line tool, w doesn't have all the, the, the features that you really want in a multi-server setup. And, it, and I give all the reasons for that here in this little GitHub link. So I put a link in chat. That's a list of all of my opinions around why I think, even just for like a single node server, if that's all, all you need, and you want to set up the server yourself, then Compose might still be better off if you used it with Swarm instead of the Docker Compose command line tool. 
But we're going to learn about other ways to do it now today. And, and Docker is evolving. Docker is moving past you build, building your own servers, and they're just deploying directly to cloud now. We have AWS and Azure integrations that went into beta last year that allow you to de deploy directly from Docker Compose to a cloud service through the cloud APIs, not through Docker APIs, through the cloud APIs. And that's a big difference, and that's a big distinction of what Docker is focusing on going forward is allowing you to use a cloud's specific environments and tooling rather than them enforcing you to say, hey, you must go build a server, you must install Docker on it. Um, you know, nowadays we have many ways to run containers. So Docker is adapting to that world. And I think it's great because we're getting away from building our own servers and managing our own servers, which was the promise of the cloud to begin with, right? We didn't want to have to maintain security patches on Ubuntu and have to reboot it every month. Like that, that was something that we were all doing over the last decade, but we're, we're all finding new ways like serverless and a lot of these new ideas for how to deploy software where we don't have to maintain the infrastructure. And that's a good thing. You're talking to the ops guy and I'm saying, I don't want to have to manage those servers, right? I have, I have too much else to manage. I need to improve my monitoring. I've got, you know, I've got a thousand things on the list that don't include patching and rebooting servers, installing security tools on servers and the host, like all these things, right? I, I don't want to write another system D config script. I, I, I could just, I'd be okay with that if I'd never had to do that again. So anyway, um, let's get to some questions real quick. Uh, the first one real up, real early. Thanks, Anton. Always got some great questions for us. Uh, I hate slow build times. I've got 40 plus services in Compose. Average build time, even with parallel, is about 30 to 40 minutes. So um, build times, so that does, so first off, let's separate slow builds from what Docker's doing, right? So if you build your app on your host machine, is it slow? Like, if, does it take forever? Because, I mean, I, you know, certain apps like Ruby apps and Python, uh, Ruby apps and PHP apps in particular, some Python apps maybe, um, they're just slow to build to begin with. Like there, there's so many other dependencies and there's so many different tools that people use in their pipelines that I end up with hundreds of lines in a Docker file for one app. And that can take 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So uh, average build time, even with dash dash parallel is about 30 to 40 minutes. So one of the things that I would recommend you try is build kit. We're going to get into a demo of that today using the new Docker command. Sorry, yeah, it's a new Docker command, but it's the new Docker Compose tool that's built into Docker. So it's Docker space Compose, not Docker dash Compose. So it's basically Docker rewriting Compose, the, the command line tool, specifically the command line tool. They're extracting the goodies from it and then rewriting that in Go in the Docker binary itself. So... We're gonna, I'm gonna show that off. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we can have a whole show to talk about parallelizing things in your Docker file using BuildKit. So definitely go look, look at BuildKit. I've got some previous shows where we talk about BuildKit. Um, and if you do multi-stage builds correctly, then you could have a Docker file that's building where maybe you're doing an NPM install and an apt install and maybe Maybe you're on you know, Ruby and you're doing a bundle install. And you could have all those things happening in parallel inside a single build. Now, if you're building 30 and 40 containers, you said 40 plus services. If you're building them all and they're all having to deploy NPM dependencies and all that, um, you know, that sounds almost like at some point a limitation of your CPU. <laughs> so um, there's lots of things that can go wrong there, right? The bind mounts, can there are certain settings in bind mounts that can cause problems depending on your OS that can cause really slow file performance. So if you're doing lots of, um, pre, you know, sort of pre-generating like your JavaScript and CSS minifying things and doing stuff like that, where you're doing lots of writes, that can also be a problem. So there's kind of a checkoff list of maybe ten things that I would go through. That's a, that's a lot of them in a, in a summary, but um, I, I doubt that it's related to Compose, right? Like it's not Compose being slow because all really Compose is doing is talking to the Docker API and telling Docker to do things for you. And it's just automating those tasks. It's not doing a whole lot in the background that it's just sending off constructions to Docker and letting Docker do things. So if Docker is causing it to be slow, then it's Docker's fault, not so much Compose. But um, yeah, if you want to get more specific into a specific example, feel free and we'll see if we can get to it. Compose, yeah, yeah. 
I love compose format. That's what David says. All right. <laughs> yeah, traffic. Uh, well, you, you might also argue that traffic is flexible. You can use it from the command line. You can use it from a, a Toml. You can use it from YAML, I think now. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I like that uh, Compose definitely started with YAML, stuck with it. Um, and then it's maintained its simplicity. Even though it's relatively limited in features compared to Kubernetes, uh, it's simple and, and can be quite effective, I think, for local development. Biker saying variable substitution sucks. I finally wrote my own preprocessor. Replace keys with parameter values um, rather than using the swarm deploy env variables. Yeah, that's probably a longer conversation to talk about exactly um, what your needs are. There are a couple of attempts from Docker to allow higher level templating, including the Docker app tool that allows you to generate Compose YAML from a higher level template and uh, as well as share those templates around so you can actually share compose files inside of container images. Um, but yeah, and to be clear, a lot of these advancements in compose over the last year are not effect, like do not work in Swarm. So for example, the new Docker Compose tool that's Docker Space Compose, that's built into Docker, doesn't use, doesn't affect Swarm, doesn't get work with, doesn't work with Swarm. And the, another new thing I want to talk about is that Docker late last year removed any version requirements. If you're using the latest versions of the Docker Compose tool, to command line tools, whether that's Docker Dash Compose or Docker Space Compose, you don't need a version anymore. And you can use all the features of the two and three branches, which is great. It's like a merging of all of the things. Um, but none of, that's, none of that works in Swarm yet. So, and, and I'm not sure that Docker is going to, to fix that. Like, that's going to be up to Mirantis to fix that in Swarm. Um, I think Docker's just, you know, Docker, the company, will support Mirantis and whatever they're doing with Swarm, but isn't necessarily going to put a team on it themselves to keep make Swarm better. That, that's just not their focus anymore. They're not going to, I don't think they're going to take it away anytime soon, but, um, you know, they're, they're leaving that up to Mirantis since Mirantis took all those employees and actually took the Swarm team with them when they, when they bought that part of Docker in 2019. 2019, that was a long time ago. Um, so David says, I hate that Compose is not part of the CLI. Well, it is now. So go check it out. Latest version. Just type Docker space Compose space up and see what happens. We're going to do a demo here in a minute. Um, let's see. Uh, hey Val, I'm not talking about Kubernetes today, sorry. Um, I'm gonna focus on Compose, but uh, I do not believe there is a one easy command in Kubernetes yet to get the token, so for joining. I'd say that it depends on your deployment tool. What tool are you using? Rancher, VMware, uh, Microcates, you know, that tool will affect how you join nodes more, I think, than Kubernetes itself. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Biker's saying, and I think that's just because Swarm, like you're talking about Swarm and the limitations of the templating, and I think it's largely due to the fact that Swarm never got the full treatment. Swarm does all of the YAML stuff on the local, on the local machine inside the Docker command line. It doesn't actually send it to the server. Um, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not ideal, and it never got the attention it deserved after, let's say, 2019, right? So. Um, Starting with 2018, the Swarm team was was uh, not as big as it used to be, and so when they would add new stuff or new features to Compose, like the you know this new version list Compose or um, some of the other things like the .env file support and the Docker Compose command line tool, like none of those things made it in the Swarm, and I think that was just the the sign that you know Docker isn't necessarily making Swarm their priority.
Um, so David, on a single machine, I would still look at the link that I sent up earlier in chat. If you're considering a single machine, I would still argue that Swarm, in a lot of cases, is better than Docker Compose. But that might be changing now that Docker Compose tool is built into Docker itself. If you're, um, if you're deploying GitLab self-hosted on a single machine, um, all the Docker commands, you're going to end up having to put them in a script because they're gonna, you're going to have to create networks and you have Docker commands and volume commands and all these things, and that's going to be really long. So um, in most cases, the Docker Compose traditional tool, so I'm going to say Docker Dash Compose, the traditional tool for Docker Compose, that, um, that tool would work in most cases on a single machine. Um, as long as you're not trying to do anything too fancy with pulling in environment variables um, into that that file, uh, it should work just fine, and it'll work on fine on reboots. But um, it doesn't have health checks. It doesn't store secrets. It doesn't. It doesn't support config files. It. Um, you know, you can't add a second machine later if you want to. Uh, you can't uh, have it do a rolling update of your containers so that you never have downtime or you have very little downtime. Like it just. It's it's a little bit more of a local development workflow tool, even though technically people use it on servers every day. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of those concerns about uptime, health checks, security. It doesn't have those kind of concepts, concepts as much as uh, Swarm or Kubernetes does. So it's not that you can't use it. It's just that maybe start with that and then maybe evolve to a tool like Swarm or Kubernetes to, to run your GitLab. And I'm sure that there are plenty of GitLab Kubernetes examples that you can just run microcates, you know, um, something like that, or K3S, keys, whatever. Um, you can run one of those simple Kubernetes tools and probably pr get someone else's provided uh, Kubernetes manifest or Helm chart. Yeah, Niels is saying, uh, go check out the kubeadmin. So if you're installing, if you installed your Kubernetes with kubeadmin, then you would use that tool. If you're, if you, like in, in microkates, um, micro K8s is what I sometimes call it. Um, but I'm trying to adopt what I think they're calling it, which is micro Uh Micro K8 does, I also have like a one line uh, join kind of command. Hello, India. Um, Raymond says, why is Kubernetes used in production of Docker Swarm? Um, so Docker Swarm, uh, look, multiple reasons, but mostly because Docker, uh, because Kubernetes uh, has a lot more third party support and has a lot more add-ons that Docker never really gained support for with Swarm. And then eventually Docker's Swarm team was moved to a different company, Mirantis, and um, there's only a couple of people that are maintaining Swarm. They're still maintaining it, but it's not getting a lot of new features. So a lot of us you know, like it, use it, for, and I still use it for projects, but they're really simple projects. And then when it gets more complicated, if it's more, you know, if it's 10 servers in a business that they're gonna invest in a year's worth of time, um, then Kubernetes is the right choice there. Maybe Nomad, but um, I, I, you know, the people that use Nomad, um, I don't know them. <laughs> so I, I know people that have tried it. Uh, I don't think there's no negatives to new Nomad. I just, I just don't know or work with anyone that's using it. So my my worldview is that even though Nomad is a really popular project and really cool, that um, it's not the default. So I would say if you don't have, if you're gonna, if this is for your work, and you don't. Uh, have a mandate to use something, learn a little bit about Swarm because it's built in. The, the, the concepts still apply between Swarm and Kubernetes. You still have uh, the idea of multiple replicas and rolling updates and secrets and configs. Like all these concepts are the same between the tools. There's just slightly different features in those ideas, but the, the concepts are important. And I t tend to teach Swarm and then I say, okay, that was easy mode. Now let's go complicated. And then I teach Kubernetes. So at some point, I'll probably will drop Swarm support unless we see Mirantis suddenly throw in a bunch of new effort. Like if they get CSI support for better storage, which I know they're working on, uh, we just don't know when they're going to release it. But supposedly they're going to have a, um, a working model where you can use Kubernetes CSI standard storage type of interfaces inside of Swarm and, and Docker itself, ho hopefully. So that's something that both Docker and Mirantis want. So maybe we'll see some uptick on Swarm use once. Because for me, the, one of the biggest problems with Swarm is lack of storage support so that I, I can't easily use third-party storage tools or network storage and stuff like that in a Swarm environment. Hello, Portugal.
Should I use Compose for one-off CMD containers which have some other service-like dependencies, or is this perhaps better to run services in Compose and run the one-off container separately with Docker Run? All right, so if you're talking about, um, Pickle Rick, if you're talking about local development, 100%, I always use Docker Compose. I always, I teach it, I use it. Um, most of the pe reason people go and use a regular Docker command when they're doing local Docker Compose development is because they didn't realize Docker Compose has that tool, has that, has that feature. It has that command, and it's probably easier to use with Compose. Compose, for example, Docker Compose PS will only show you the containers, even though you might have 100 containers in Docker, it will only show you the containers listed for your current project of the directory you're in. If you do a Docker Compose run, it will spin up a new one-use container with that particular name, and will do it inside your project with a proper name on the proper networking with all that stuff. So um, Docker Compose exec, Docker Compose top, like there's so many great commands with Docker Compose that people don't invest the time to learn. And then they, they revert back to regular Docker commands, but they don't need to because Compose does all those things, taking your Compose file into context when it's doing them. So it's, I think it's really great. Um, in fact, with, when I talk to developers and I teach them, uh, I will teach them first the basics of Docker, but we will then very quickly, once they got the concepts down of networking and storage and images and containers, I will move very quickly to compose because very few people need to run just one container. They usually need a database and a web server at least. So I will immediately get them into compose so they can start thinking about their workflows right up front with how they're gonna do that in a multi-container world. And then we never go back to Docker commands. <laughs> you know, there's a couple, maybe like a Docker, I don't think there's a Docker Compose prune, um, but, and there, you know, Docker Compose push will push with all the proper names and your images and all that stuff. So there's um, pretty, pretty neat stuff in there that a lot of people don't, don't, know, don't know about. Or Docker Compose pull, which will pull all the images first. Um, we'll do all that in a second. Uh, in five years perspective, is it better to invest in Kubernetes or Docker Swarm? I'd say Kubernetes, especially if you're talking about investment in your in your job. Um, the future is uncertain for Swarm in five years outlook. There is no uncertainty about the future of Kubernetes. In five years, it should be more stable, more, more feature rich. Um, you know, there's tons and tons, of, there's billions of dollars basically behind Kubernetes at this point. There is very little dollars behind Swarm. Uh, it's basically, you know, a few people at Mirantis and a few community me members that are that are left building it and supporting it. It still works. Um, just because a tool stops adding rapid new features doesn't mean I'm going to stop using it. Like, I use curl every day, but it doesn't get rapid new features because it's mature. And I think that Swarm got to a place where it did enough and attention needed to be put elsewhere. And it you know, it wasn't really making anyone any money. So um, it didn't get the attention like K Kubernetes has got. So I think it's nice to know about Swarm and to know some of the basics. Um, I still use it in personal projects. I no longer recommend Swarm for my clients. Um, not because Swarm is bad. It's because I think there are now better tools. Kubernetes has better tooling now. It's easier to deploy. We now have all these cloud services that can deploy containers without me ever having to care about building a server. And I much prefer those, you know? Azure's ACI or ECS on AWS or Google Cloud Run, um, or frankly, Heroku, <laughs> which now deploys containers, right? There's so many ways I can deploy containers without having to build a swarm cluster and make them fault tolerant. Yeah, definitely that thing about Compose is, is just like Kubernetes Manifest. It, it creates a declarative um, model of the, of the intended state and allows you to implement a single line command that will result in that state, right? You don't have to, um, if the Docker commands like Docker, Docker run are imperative commands, they do exactly the thing you told them to do right now and only what you told them to do. And they don't care if something changes, right? Like, uh, but a declarative command like Docker Compose Up will look at what you've told it to do and it will keep working until all those things are what, where you told them to be in an asynchronous way. So that's why I like it.
Yeah, Python. Uh, so Python IP allocation problems. So I have seen some very large project problems with Compose. One of the couple of things that you might want to try um, when it comes to the old Docker Compose tool, Docker dash Compose, I'm going to call it old now because we now have this new one, Docker space Compose. So the old one that was built in Python, um, when you run the Docker, if you install that binary, it's using py installer in the background. So that means every time you run the Docker Compose command line, it's technically unpacking all of the Python and then doing things like py, py installer does. And so some people in the Docker captains community, like uh, Nick Genetakis, uh, Genetakis, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, Nick figured out that Basically, if you're doing that type of Docker Compose binary, you're, you're actually adding like 400 milliseconds to every Docker Compose command. So if you install it with pip, it installs the Python, and that will re reduce the complexity, re removes py installer from the equation, and it just runs you know, immediately as, as, and instead of having to extract the, the stuff in the background. And so when I'm on Linux now, I always install Docker Compose with pip because it's a Python tool. But that's the old way. Like, go check out Docker Space Compose. Um, all right, let me catch up on chat real quick, and then we're going to get into some examples, and I'm going to talk about where this is all going. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, Owen. Hello, Martin. Um, Biker's asking about Azure's container registry to build capability rather than running my own build server. So I don't know, I haven't used ACR yet, but so far every container image registry like Docker Hub that can build stuff in the background tends to be a very basic CI tool, right? So building images to me is about CI. It's about testing, and then once testing is validated, build the image. Um, or put the your testing inside the image itself, so it's doing an actual run command and running, you know, like npm test or something. So you can technically do your testing while you're build, building an image. But what I find is, is that those those tools and maybe ACR is way better. But those tools that are sort of registry first, builder second, don't seem to have the level of tooling that you would expect of a full CI tool. Never mind like CD. Um, so. I would be concerned about that, but I have not used ACR. So um, let me know. Uh, check it out, Biker, and let us know. Since you know you've you've obviously run your own build servers for a long time, like you, everybody you know knows CI, so you know what to expect from a tool. And then something like Docker Hub, for example, can build and it can even run tests for you. And you can use a little YAML, a compose file. If you didn't know this, you can use Docker Compose dash test dash YAML in your repo, and Docker Compose will run those tests inside of Docker Hub automatically when Docker Hub builds your image. Who knew, right, that you can actually test? But, you know, the metrics and, and the reporting are not great. And it doesn't give you like pipeline views, uh, you know, like with graphics and stuff like that. There's just none of that. So it tends to not scale in a team well, and it doesn't integrate with GitHub so that you see in like PRs that your PR has been tested. Like there's none of that. Uh, it's, it's a pretty rudimentary build tool. So I would look for that kind of thing if you're looking at the ACR build. I'm setting up Jenkins. Do I use Docker or Docker Compose to build the image? Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it depends on whether you're doing it as a human or automated. Um, if a human is building this image, then Docker Compose is designed to be the human-friendly version of Docker commands. So maybe I would, I would say there, use Docker Compose commands because they're easy, Docker Compose build, right? You can build a specific service in Docker Compose, just one of the services by t typing Docker Compose build and then the name of the service. Or you can just type Docker Compose build and it will build them all. Um, and like um, Anton, I think mentioned earlier, if you use dash dash parallel, it will build multiple container images in parallel. Um, so yeah. I would say try compose if you don't like it. If you do Docker, if you just do a bunch of Docker run commands, now you're just writing scripts because now you know those Docker run commands are going to be long, or those Docker build commands rather. You know they might be long. Um, you also want to look at Docker build X. Docker build X is the next generation of builder tool, and it can it can build things across multiple architectures and platforms. It can automatically push images when they're done building. It can do things that you can't do 
with the Docker build command or Docker compose command, really. So Docker build X, go check that out too. All right. Let me get into some examples and talk about some stuff real quick. And then uh, I'll come back to chat because uh, we've been chatting now for a half an hour. Uh, all right. So let's go back a year. Docker uh, announces the Compose specification. So what is this? This is Docker. Um, ironically, the Compose file, we all kind of thought that was a specification, right? I treated the, the Compose file and its versions, like version two, version three. I, I treated those as specifications of how to write my Compose files for Docker Compose, for Swarm, and for all the other tools out there that use Compose, um, like Kubernetes Compose with a K, um, or whatever, right? Like all these other tools out there. I know ECS has a tool for importing Compose files. So it turned out that there wasn't really an official specification. It was just that the Docker Compose YAML file was an implementation of a unwritten specification that Docker had in their head. Like they kind of knew what they wanted and then they wrote the Compose file from that. So now they've formally created a, a specification. Uh, we've showed it on the show, I think a couple of weeks ago. So you can dig into it. Um, uh, the specification is here. So it breaks down like, you know, what services are, networks are, volumes, configs, secrets, uh, the compose file, which is um, how you format that. And then the compose command line tool is uh, considered one of the implementations. So if you go back, you can see under implementations, we have the Docker compose command line tool, we have the Docker stack command, which is what uh, Biker has been talking about, the Docker stack command. Compose on Kubernetes, which was um, a project that's kind of, I don't know if it's end of life or where the, it is in the support cycle, but it was basically meant to run in a Kubernetes server and automatically take your Compose and apply it. But that was before we had like CRDs and operators um, in full featured Compose or Kubernetes world. Like, so it's a little legacy now. I don't, I'm not sure that there's a great status on that um, in terms of its future. But it was a great idea, right? Deploy on Kubernetes with a Compose file. That, we all kind of want that, an easier way to make manifests that, that implies certain reasonable defaults. Because that's the thing about the Compose command line and the Compose file format, is there's a, lot, there's a lot there. There's a reason it's shorter than Kubernetes. It's because not only does it support less things, but it, Im it implies certain things when you type stuff in it. It's, it's a very opinionated tool, in my, in my opinion. Uh, compared to manifest, which Kubernetes manifest being on average three times or four times larger, they're unopinionated. So you have to be much more specific, right? And when you're when you're putting in a container spec into a deployment manifest, you have to create the metadata that compose file formats just assume. They assume that the name of the service is the name that you want it to have. Whereas you don't assume that in Kubernetes, you give it a... Uh, some metadata and a name key value, right? So there's, there's a lot of that verbosity uh, in Kubernetes that you don't get in Compose, but Compose is a much more opinionated tool, which I tend to agree with. And most things with Compose, that's why I like it. If you're someone who does not agree with the Compose way of doing things, then you're not gonna, you know, it, it's, there's no way to change it. It's kind of, you're kind of stuck. So you, you go to something like Kubernetes. And then Compose, which is uh, a tool if you haven't used is a, a converter, uh, basically, that will convert your Compose YAML into Kubernetes. All right, so those are different ways. Now, there's a lot of other tools that actually do this, but the, uh, these, are, I guess, are the official ones that are trying to standardize on the spec. So step one, we got a spec. Yay, we can all agree on things. Step two was, late last year, the Compose team, uh, they decided that versioning was actually the bad idea in the Compose file itself. Now, you're still going to have versions of tools that implement this file. Like you're going to have a Docker dash compose CLI version. You're going to have a Docker CLI version. Um, but when it comes to the file itself, it will not be versioned anymore. And in fact, the current version is no version. Uh, if you actually go to their documentation now, you will see that the latest and recommended version of compose file format is defined by the compose specification. The format merges two and three branches and is implemented in any 
Docker dash compose command line tool 127 or newer. So we, um, if we go over to Docker slash compose slash releases, if we go to GitHub and look, um, they just released 128 um, eight days ago. And it had a couple of major changes, including some libraries. And those libraries caused problems. So they've actually rapidly rolled back some of the library updates, uh, including a Python um, change. I don't know where one is at. I don't know why. I guess maybe, yeah, I don't know what one did. But anyway, so 128 is the newest one. 127 came out, uh, I don't know, six months ago. And so now if you're on, the, on these versions, you can take all the versioning out of your compose file and you can use whatever feature you want, whether it's two branch or three branch. Um, however, it doesn't work in Swarm because Swarm was never updated for this new compose specification. So you might say that Swarm today does not support the compose specification officially. It only supports the compose file version three formats. Okay. But going forward, what will happen is we will add features. If, there, if there's new stuff that shows up in the compose file, it will be because it's implementing things from the official compose specification, which hopefully means it'll be more compatible with other tooling like AWS and Azure, which we will talk about. All right. Next, after that, what happened? And you can, by the way, you can also see in 127. Oh, yeah. This came out in September. So the September release of the Docker Compose command line tool is when they merged the two and three formats to align with the Compose spec schema. And then Docker announced over the summer that we can now use Docker Space Compose, and we can now do that to deploy to Azure ACI, Azure Container Instances. And we can now do it, um, nope, that's not what I want. We can now do it <laughs> on ECS as well. So ACI is not an orchestrator, technically. It's technically a single system that I understand and it installs containers on a single, single system. But you're not using the Docker uh, APIs to do this. You're using the Azure APIs to do this. So that's a big deal. And then on this ECS add-on, what you're doing is Docker space compose space up. So it's built into the Docker command line now as a Golang, not Python, but at, in Go with a native language developed for the Docker engine. And you can now cr spin up and deploy to ECS clusters using the Docker command line tool. So if you miss those shows, we did whole entire shows on this last summer, um, as well as Docker has also done this a lot on their channel. So you can go over to YouTube's Docker channel and you can go back and see a lot of the stuff they talk about with ECS and Azure. If we have time, we can get into some of those demos. All right. So, and there was announcements about that on the blog. You can go look in the documentation. You can go look in the Docker blog. They all, they talk about Azure ECS and, I'm sorry, AWS ECS and Azure ACI. <laughs> those acronyms, those acronyms are rough for me. Um, but you can go check those out and we can get into demos if we have time. All right, next up, Docker releases this Docker space compose new idea as a separate, it's technically right now a separate library in Docker's GitHub. So what's happening right now is Docker is very active at rewriting Compose, the tool, inside of the Docker command line. And they're doing that in the open. And so now you can go to the roadmap, which I've talked about that over and over again on this show. You can go to the Docker, github.com slash Docker slash roadmap, and you can put in your opinions for features you want to see in that tool. And then you can come here to the Docker Compose CLI repo, and you can file bug issues when you're using it. I have filed, I think, at least one myself. Either that or I put it in the, to the Slack chat with the team and told them that I was having a... The, there's some YAML formatting differences. So the Go YAML parser works a little bit different than the Python YAML parser. So it turns out that when you use the new tool, it might be a little pickier in your YAML that you were a little sloppy with. And I was a little sloppy. Maybe I didn't put things in quotes when I should have put them in quotes. And so it's a little pickier. Um, but anyway, so you had, this, you had this repo over there. I'm gonna 
put all these links. A lot of these links, if you're on YouTube, are in the down below in the description of the video. And um, so that I think brings us up to date. So what's happening right now? Like all the action is in Docker Space Compose. That's where all the action's happening. That's where all the new features are. That's where we can now use the new build kit builder by default. That's where we can now deploy to Azure or AWS automatically just by adding a new context. That's where we can um, we can implement new ideas for how Compose is gonna be in 2021 rather than implement them in the old Python tool that is kind of showing its cracks a little bit, right? It's where there's you know, some, some, some things that have happened over the last few years with Compose in Python that have been challenging. Uh, you know, it's a, different, it's a different install. It doesn't, it sometimes has conflicts with different libraries and different Python versions. And, you know, there's the speed performance issue with it extracting because it's using Py installer, depending on how you install it. There's like three ways to install it. It's just, you know, it's, it's tough because it's, we're trying to treat it like a binary, like a statically compiled binary, but it's Python, so it's not. Um, well now since, and, and there's duplicate code bases where, you know, st things that are happening in Docker could maybe be used by compose, but it was written in a se completely separate language. So there was no real optimization there. So now this has been a dream. I was at in 2016, I was in Berlin when the Docker team announced that they were, they were, they didn't really officially announce it. They were kind of rumoring or talking amongst themselves that they wanted to bring compose into Docker, the command line and rewrite it and go. That was 2016, four years ago, folks. <laughs> that was a long time ago. And they're finally, they finally launched it last year. They finally did it. Now it's still experimental, but um, you can use it right now. I don't, I don't actually know if you need experimental on. Maybe somebody can, can test Docker space compose dash space up and tell me if they're, what results they get. Let's, um, Let me go over here. So um, I'm in an example voting app. So you've, if you're taking my courses, you know that I do this voting app thing. It's a, a common demo from Docker and it's, it's got five different, um, five different, uh, what am I looking for? five different parts of the app. It's got a web front end to vote. It's got a web back end to see the results of the vote. You're voting on dogs versus cats. There's a database, there's a Redis queue, you know, there's a worker. It's a very typical um, back end, front end, worker kind of job scenario thing. And uh, I have a couple of examples here. So I could use docker-compose-f to specify my file because it's not the default file name. And I could do this. Right? And that's what we've all done before. And it's going to pull images and do all that stuff. But I'm going to stop that because if I simply do that same command, but if I take out the dash, it now uses the Docker CLI in the new written Go language. And it does a lot of new things by default that I would have to manually enable and compose, like using the new build kit. So you'll start to see the format looks different. And you're seeing. This is the builder, uh, build kit builder doing things in a parallel way. Uh, it, it, by default, it will do things more parallelized, including different layers and stages of your, your Docker file. Um, and, oh, and I've, I'm already running it. So <laughs> that's part of my problem. But anyway, uh, not to go too, too much in that demo yet, but just try that. Like if you're on your machine, go try that. Do, do your Docker Compose up like you normally would but put a space in there and see if it just works. It may just, it should just work. And that's pretty cool. But we don't have all of the commands yet. So if I do docker compose dash help, they're, they're adding, right? They're, they're getting there. They got, they got some important ones, the build, the up, the down, the LS, the PS, the push, the pull, the run. Um, I, let's see, I don't see an exec, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so I know exec is coming because I think I've, I've asked the team about that and I do believe that's in the roadmap. But if I did a Docker compose, dash dash help, you'll see that it has a lot more commands, right? So they're, they're not 
since it's still an experimental, they're not, they don't have all of the subcommands ready yet. So we're going to have to give them some time to add that. But you can start using it today. And you should be able to use these interchangeably. Like if the command doesn't exist in Docker Space Compose, you should be able to just use that command with Docker Dash Compose. They're trying to make them work together so that you can still experiment with the new one while still supporting the old one. And it doesn't change the file format. I think, like I said, the only difference I've experienced so far in YAML is that the Go parser in the Docker command is a little more strict on YAML formatting. It basically adheres, I think, a little bit tighter to the YAML specification where maybe the Python one, you know, in some cases, if you didn't quote things, it would just assume you meant to quote them. Um, at least that's how I understand it. In my experience, I've, I've been running stuff for a while in it and it's every once in a while I get a compose file that it complains about some label that I didn't quote or something that I messed up. All right, let me look at chat real quick, see if I can catch up. Yeah, Anton, yes, I, I, to answer your question you just asked. Um, yeah. Uh, the Docker Compose, the Docker Space Compose and Docker Dash Compose can be used interchangeably. Um, by the way, for my shell, brettfisher.com slash shell, all of my tooling, all of my add-ons, my themes, that's all in there. So go check that out if you're, you have questions about my shell setup. <laughs> you missed a few minutes in my dropping swarm. I'm not dropping swarm. I'm just not expanding on swarm. Uh, um, you know, it's no longer my go-to. It, and it hasn't been for some time because, I, you know, we haven't seen but one feature in swarm in a year. And so for new people, swarm's still great. It's still an introductory, introductory tool. I think it's a great learning tool. And I still use it for my own website. Breadfisher.com still runs on swarm. Um, I still know people that are running it plenty of people that are running it in production. It's perfectly fine. I'm just not implementing it in teams of people, mostly because it doesn't have great networking and storage support for anything other than the defaults, right? The, the, the third-party market is kind of never, you know, it's never supported Swarm. There's only a few drivers out there that I know that still support Swarm. So that, that's been problematic in the cloud. Uh, I'm also tired of running servers and my clients don't have time to run servers and they all run in the cloud. So I want them to run a cloud provided orchestrator. And the only one that does that is Kubernetes. So I have a choice right now. When this customer A is on AWS, do I recommend EKS for them and Fargate? Or do I recommend them hand building servers and then installing Docker and enabling Swarm manually and then building that out? You know, I'd rather them just have this thing. I'd rather them just use Fargate and never have to worry about it. You know, tear down nodes, spin up nodes. It's automatic. They're just paying for containers. Um, I'd rather them use that when they can. And then EKS is a backup when they need something like persistent disk and that they, uh, I'm not sure that you can support. Maybe you can some of it in Fargate. I, I'm trying to remember if Fargate started supporting um, the NFS, the EFS I don't remember. Anybody, anybody know the latest on that? Um, I know that they wanted to add it eventually, but not sure if that's there. Yeah, Andre is saying, I have the exact same problem, lack of storage and swarm. Uh, Janeway, I don't know anything about Janeway. Fractured Adam. Uh, someone may have told me about it, but I don't rem don't recall it. All right. Yeah, yeah. The overlay is subnet limited to uh, 254 uh, IPs. Uh, yeah, that is that can be a problem for some environments. Uh, there were some famous examples of that way back in the day where a uh, ghost blog company 
company behind Ghost Blog, which is my favorite blog, which my website runs on. Um, Ghost, the team tried to deploy all of their customers, tried to migrate all their customers to Swarm, and it wouldn't scale because they wanted they needed them all to be on one overlay network. And the overlay networking uses like what Weave uses or any other overlay technology. It it pack it emulates or emulates it encapsulates packets, and it, there's a performance hit as well as other. Um, potential problems that scale when you're really scaling up large. Um, but it's meant to be easy use, ease of use for sm- small clusters and small groups of people. And it's great when you're using small groups and small numbers of people. But once you get to 1,000 containers, it maybe isn't the right solution. And, and Swarm doesn't have to use that. You can use Mac IP and some other things with Swarm. You don't have to use Overlay. But um, yeah, that is a big problem for people. And yet uh, one more reason why people are migrating to Kubernetes as they mature and evolve their infrastructure, they want more tooling and there's not a lot out there for Swarm unless they build it themselves. Um, what, uh, so I, I answered this question, uh, Pio Trezru, sorry, <laughs> I'm not trying to pronounce that. Um, yeah, uh, I answered that earlier. So um, at the very beginning, if you scroll up in the chat, there's a, the first link that takes you to my AMA talks about Swarm versus Compose for a single server. I still like Swarm for single server setups. I prefer that over Compose, but um, a MicroKate server is just as easy. Um, and assuming that you know how to write Kubernetes manifest YAML and you know the basics of Kubernetes, a, a single server MicroKates or K3S with ketchup, keys with ketchup, which is another way to deploy a single server. Um, let's see, are there good task challenges to set up Docker files or Kubernetes clusters to get more practical experience? Most courses are theoretical and I find it hard to transfer to real tasks. Um, I, not, sh- I mean, other than my courses, I don't know that I have anything else. Um, you might look at my dog versus cat repo. So type in dog vs dot cat, type that URL in your browser. Type that in. Dog versus cat is my demo repo of Swarm. Uh, you can use all that for Compose. Like all the Compose files are completely compatible. So you can learn about a little bit more like it t- teaches you some things around ingress and there's a video there from DockerCon and how you might use that. But yeah, I'm not sure more examples. I am working on some examples actually that will come out later this year for the voting repo, the example voting repo. So there'll be a little bit more developer workflow focused and they will hopefully go into my courses or be released on the internet or something. I'm not sure what's going to happen but there, but um Um, uh, so if you're asking about coder AVG, if you're asking about getting in, um, DevOps, so Docker, you don't need to know a coding language for Docker, but if you want to get into DevOps, which is what I think you're asking, you're saying a workload automation admin, interested in learning Docker, um, DevOps is all about automation and man and monitoring and improving business pipelines by improving the performance of code getting into production staying in production, you know, updating production, helping you know, developers uh, increase their velocity of shipping code. That's really where Docker places itself in the tooling system. So uh, there, I have a URL for that. Slash, so if you go to brett.show slash DevOps, I have all of like what you might need to do to get into DevOps. Um, but I do think it's important that you know one language enough to start with. And then as a DevOps person, I think it's more important that you not know a bunch of languages and like the deep internals of how to build apps from scratch and languages or anything. But it's more important that you understand how those languages um, in, manage their dependencies and how they should be started. So you're, you're, you're focused on, imagine your, your job is take someone's Python app and then make it run on a server and then update it on that server and then monitor it on that server. 
you're going to need to know some of the basics around how do I install its dependencies? How do I properly run this app? Like what's the command? And, you know, should I wrap it with a Docker init kind of thing, which you'll get into if you take my course? Um, you know, these kind of concerns. How do I monitor it? How do I replace it? How do I properly shut it down? Does it have a shutdown uh, effort? Are there environment variables I have to set? So you have to learn some of the basics about each language and packaging system in order to understand how to help with that. And that's really, I think, where DevOps spends a lot of their time is taking the code, helping the, do the developers with the code that they're writing, helping and advising them on getting that code ready for a quality type of deployment lifecycle where it's rapidly being able to, to deploy an update and then working through the CI and the CD pipelines and into the servers and into the monitoring. So it, there's a lot to it. So DevOps means lots of things. And there is no one type of DevOps job. Some people say they're, they're a DevOps engineer, but really what they just do is they manage Jenkins. That's not really a DevOps job. Um, in fact, I don't like labeling do jobs with as like the DevOps engineer. I don't even, I don't even like doing that um, because I feel like it's something that we all should be a part of is the mindset of DevOps. I talked about that before. Go read the DevOps handbook. I would do that. Read that first. And that'll give you the why and maybe some of the how, and then you can focus on tooling and languages and, you know. DevOps Handbook, go check that out. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, no need, so question, so earlier, I wasn't sure if the Docker space compose space up would work, and um, thank you, did Georgie, did Georgie? Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, or maybe the D is silent. Georgie? The, so you just need to go into Docker Desktop and enable the cloud experience option, and I guess it works. So cool. Thanks for helping me out there. Um, how do you get the Apple, Apple logo in the terminal? I, I showed it earlier. Brett.com slash shell will give you all that stuff. It's, um, it's called Nerd Fonts. Look up Nerd Fonts. Am I launching any new courses this year? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Um, we've, we're just starting on the idea of a new one that's DevOps focused uh, around DevOps mindset, but I'm not sure if it will ship this year or not. So uh, we, we will, you know, hang around. Follow me on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Brett Fisher, link below on YouTube. And you can just follow me there for free and you can get all the updates on content I'm creating when I create new stuff and I, I launch new stuff. So... Um, yeah, so, um, you have Docker version 2010 installed in your Chromebook, but no Docker Compose available yet. So that's a good point. If you're installing Docker version on a Linux machine, so you're not using Docker desktop, then what you may need to go do is go down here, um, you may need to add it through here. I'm actually not sure. Because, yeah, I'm not sure on the command line. Let me go. Um, hmm. <coughs> I don't even see it listed there. <laughs> there's no, there's no compose there at all. I was going to say I'm wondering if it's a plugin, if it, if they're using it like a plugin. That's a good question. I don't know on Linux how you get uh, compose. Um, oh, install script right there. So do, go to the Docker command, Docker compose CLI website, and use the install script. Yeah, and what does that install script do? Oh, it looks like it's a full, is it a full build of Docker? A new version of Docker? Interesting. That's interesting. So it's almost like it's a separately built Docker binary that you um, replace the one built in. 
just for the CLI, right? Like it doesn't affect your engine. It just affects the CLI you're using. So it's like an updated or expanded version. Interesting. So there you go. I didn't know that. Hey, thanks, Niels. Thanks for the super sticker. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Docker projects to do hands-on experience. So I would recommend my Docker Mastery course, which you go through several projects. You deploy uh, a, a, a CMS server. You set up a multi-container application um, called the examples, the voting examples, and, and more. So you set up a, a basic proxy. Uh, then you get into Swarm and then you get into Kubernetes. So check the link below. There's a coupon below in YouTube that will get you the Docker Mastery course for less than $20, American dollars. What are the prereqs uh, for starting with Docker and Kubernetes? I would say uh, knowing, um, knowing networking, knowing a little bit of the cloud, know about Linux and know about shells. Like just be able to operate a Linux machine and spin it up, spin up a Linux server and install stuff on it, understanding what apt is, you know, like apt-get, stuff like that. Um, if you go look at my Docker Mastery course on Udemy, links below, uh, you can, you, there's a requirements list there that basically says like, understand TCP networking, understand basics of cloud and you know how to deploy a cloud server and make that thing work. Um, and know how to install basic apps on a Linux server and set up a web server, you know, stuff like that. You're probably gonna wanna know some basics of Git like just the git tool um you're gonna want some of that kind of stuff basically if you've deployed an app to the cloud or you've installed on a server installed an app on a server got it running and you're used, using the command line on linux like you're, you're probably fine you can jump in you can jump right in with my courses are there any new updates in the k8s course no not yet um although we are working on videos right now um like this week and last week and next week so um, the way to keep up with that update on that is to uh, follow the Udemy announcements for the course or follow me on Patreon. So you just go over to Patreon. The link is below in YouTube and follow me on Patreon and I'll announce when there's new major updates there as well. Because uh, sometimes the Udemy emails, they're kind of spammy sometimes. So you, they might get lost in your spam filter uh, or you might just turn those off. So if you want to follow my updates on the courses that are anything other than just a, a little fix, um, go check me out on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Brett Fisher. All right. I changed my API to use, uh, Danny says, I changed my API to use an S3 bucket to store uploads instead of local storage to be prepared for a cluster. How would a storage solution look like in Kubernetes? The same way. I mean, you can use S3 with Kubernetes just like you use it with your, your normal app. Um, yeah, it doesn't change at all. Your app, your app talks to object storage, basically HTTP type storage the same way, regardless of where it's running, whether it's in Docker or Kubernetes or whether it's in Lambda or whether it's on Google Cloud Run, like it doesn't matter. That's your app talking to an HTTP endpoint. So you just have to feed it the environment variables like you normally would or a config file if that's how you configure your app and it should be fine. All right. Yeah, and, and the, yeah, the de, uh, Devo1D, Devoid, uh, I like it, Devoid. The Docker, new Docker Compose is definitely faster, right? Like there's no, uh, I talked earlier about the Py installer, that how that works with Python. There's no running of the Python in the background. It's just gonna be, a, it's a compiled, um, a pre-compiled Go binary that is just like the, it's as fast as the Docker commands are, right? So there's no delay. You start with Docker and Kubernetes, you have to first grow a beard. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, yes, Ralph, Helm is coming. Helm is coming to the Kubernetes course. How difficult is it to pass the CKAD? I don't know. I haven't taken it. Um, I don't know if anyone else has taken it in chat, but let Emmanuel know. Uh, practice questions re re regards to Docker or Kubernetes. Um, there's tons of them all over GitHub. 
go to GitHub and look for uh, practice questions for if you just type in the name of the certification and questions and you'll find stuff on GitHub. <laughs> the prerequisite of learning these is patience. Yes, it, it is a mind shift. It's not just learning a new tool. It's learning a new way of packaging and shipping and running your apps. Like that's huge, right? Many of us, it took years to establish the way we do things today. So that's a big deal. Um, all right. So we've been going for over an hour and I've barely got to any examples. So here's what we're going to do. Um, it, I have, have announced, I have given you all the news. If you'd like to see someone working in Compose, that's what I'm going to do now. Because the example app that I mentioned earlier, so over here, um, let's go find the example app. Is it github.com slash docker samples example voting app? So this example voting app is what I use in my courses. It's what I use um, if you go to my dog versus cat repo that I talked about earlier, that, that dog versus cat repo also uses this. And it has an architecture that looks like this. So it has traditional web front ends you're voting on dog versus cat, which one's better. And then you have a result app that, and this is a polyglot setup, right? So imagine a world where every one of your apps is written in a different language. That's one of the great things about Docker and Kubernetes is everything's isolated and everything includes its dependencies. So we can do all that. So I'm gonna go through this and getting it set up and compose and getting it working. There are some bugs in this app and I've been meaning to fix them as uh, a maintainer of some of these samples in the community. So I didn't write this thing originally. This was actually written by a couple of other people that, that used to work at Docker, like Elton Stoneman and uh, a few others, but I'm trying to keep it up to date and it's got a few quirks and a few bugs. So I'm using it Docker Compose locally and I'm only gonna use the new Docker Compose command line. I'm gonna try to do that instead of the old way because I like the new way. It's faster, it uses build kit, it builds faster. Um, it's it's great. It has colors. It looks it looks prettier when you're building. So I'm going to use that, and you can go check that out here. Um, I have my own copy of it in a different repo because I've forked it. Um, and it is examples. Example voting app. So I have my own here that is both behind and ahead <laughs> of the upstream. So I first need to fix that because we've been fixing a bunch of things upstream over the last uh, year and I have not pulled those in. So let's see, I'm in the wrong repo there. Um, all right, so I am in a compose file, and this is for this app. Let me, yeah, I'm in my repo, and I need to... I need to bring in the upstream. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. So let's see if this works. Docker compose up. Actually, what I want to do, just to show you this example, I'm going to do a Docker system prune. I'm going to delete all the images, all the containers, all the networks. Oh, I've already got stuff run running. So Mm. So, um, trying to bring this thing down. So, 
So I'm going to use the old tool for a minute. Because I was that's what I used in here, but I don't I guess I could prove that I don't need to docker compose. I need to bring this down basically. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to do a prune. So I do a docker system prune dash f dash a, which means uh, delete everything, <laughs> including images. Um, so now on my machine, when I do a docker ps, no containers, docker uh, ls, oops, that's not a thing, docker image ls, or docker images. So there's nothing on my machine. It's basically empty now. So when I do a docker space compose, let me make that a little bigger, up, So you can see in the background, it's it's downloading things in parallel. Um, it's pretty great. This is all the new build kit using the new builder tool inside of Docker, a completely rewritten build tool. All right, so now I've got things spinning up and running. All right, so one of the issues that I've had in this app is that late, uh, early last year, the Python, all right, not Python, the Postgres database server changed to a, a requirement of, of forcing you to have passwords. So one of the challenges was, was this app didn't come built to use passwords <laughs> because it's an example app. You know, it was very small. It was written like most of these parts of this app are like 50 lines of code, super small. So they just used Postgres by default, which came out of the box not requiring a password. So yeah. That didn't, it didn't happen. So now we've got to fix that. And if I go look at my compose file, it's pretty basic. So one of the things here is since I'm already using this new version, I'm just going to get rid of this version number. I don't need it. And one of the things that I love that we, I probably won't have time to get into today, but if you've seen in my dog versus cat examples, I talk about in version two of the Docker Compose file that you can use depends on with a condition. So if I go over here, let me go to the exam. Let's see, where's dog versus cat? If I go down here, Actually, you know what? It's not there. It's in DockerCon 19. I have a DockerCon 19 repo, which is also something I recommend for those of you that want and yet another example of using an app in Compose and to a detailed level. That is what I did for DockerCon 2019. And in here, I show you how to build a relatively feature complete Compose file. And I, this might yes so check this simple little example out let me zoom in a little bit so as long as in the past if you were in version 2 of the file you actually had this feature known as a condition for depends on we don't have that in version 3 but we do now because we're no longer working on versions we're now super version <laughs> super version the um which means that if my apps all have health checks, health checks, and I recommend you get health checks, and this repo talks about how to go find health checks. If you go watch the video in this repo, it'll show you how to do this. And so I put a health check on a Postgres server. So maybe I do something like that. And I'm going to put that on my database. And now my uh, database, actually, I'm not, not sure if that's going to work with a password. It's actually, actually, we need to test it. We might need to update my, my other app because it might be broke too. Um, so we're going to have our database running a health check. Now that we have a health check on it, I can go and say, this other service will not start unless the condition is healthy. So if you've ever tried to use depends on, in any of your compose files, and you were sad when you found out that your app would still try to start 
even though the database wasn't ready, because how does Docker know something's ready for connections, right? It, it doesn't by default, unless you put in a health check. So in the past, whenever we use depends on, all it would make sure is that they started in the correct order, but it doesn't mean that they are ready for connections in the right order. So we can just add this all the way up here. So under the, uh, the vote doesn't use a database, but this result app does. So I'm gonna have to change this over. to a key. And so you see how I've changed that? So I, I turned it from a list, a YAML list, into an array. And then I gave con condition is service healthy. It turns out that by default, all these years, when you were using depends on, it was implying condition, I think it's service started, I think was the, uh, uh, the implied. And there's this other condition you can act, act on, but it doesn't work in the version three. But now that we don't have versions, we get to use it again. So and I'm going to do the same thing down here because the worker needs to depend on that. So, um, is that formatted right? Yeah, I think that works. Um, so we then need a Redis health check. And one of the things that I end up doing here is when I have Redis and other, uh, things, and I have a feeling this health check is not going to work because it's going to need a password and it doesn't get the password from there. So one of the things I do is I go steal the health checks from the Docker health check library. And that is... Do I have them here? Let's see if I have them in my repo. I have them over here. I don't think I do. So if you go to github.com slash health check, Docker library, health check. I don't know why it's over here and not in, in Docker samples because uh, these are samples, but underneath here, for example, I can go pick on Redis. So what you'll notice is all these health checks that they're providing are example health checks for different types of persistent storage because your app that you make is gonna have its own type of health check. Maybe you use curl, maybe you use Node.js, maybe you use whatever your language is, maybe you do something else. That's how you might you develop your own health check. But with databases, we need to use whatever tools the database comes with. So they provide that for a lot of the open source database tools here. So we've got Redis, and you can see that there's this little bitty health check. And what I need to do is essentially provide that into my app. And then, and I could kind of, I could technically like pipe it into the compose file, but I'd rather just bind mount the health check and, and run it inside the app. Right? So you can see what they do here, is they take Redis and they copy in the health check so that it's inside the image. But I'm using Compose. So just for local development, I don't need to make my own image. I can just add the health checks themselves. So what I might do is, if this was me, this is one way of doing it, I might make a directory called health checks. And then in there, I might uh, use something called Redis. and might post that in there. All right, so all that's gonna use is the Redis command line utility to ping the local machine, just to make sure that Redis is actually accepting connections. And if it, and if it gets a pong back, then it knows that Redis is accepting connections. All right, super simple. And then I might do the same thing for Postgres. And there's an example too for that. If I go back, find Postgres. And if you look at the Docker file, you'll see it does the same thing. It just copies in the health check file and makes a new image. But I, um, and it, it, it sets the health check command. This health check command 
will automatically be used by Swarm or Compose, but it will not be used by Kubernetes. Kubernetes ignores this because it has its own uh, more flexible st set of health checks that it uses, um, whereas Docker's are, are built in are a little bit more simplistic. They basically say, I'm going to run a command in your container, and if it returns exit zero, that means it's happy and I'm okay, I'm healthy. So you have to write your own scripts for Docker itself. And this one is a little bit different. This one actually takes the database user and password for your database and pipes them into a Postgres command. You can see it here. Um, this right here. So it's using the psql command line tool with a bunch of arguments in order to connect to your database and it does a select command just selecting one record of a database. It actually, so this is actually validating not just that it can accept connections, but that the database uh, exists, a table exists, or uh, rather a database exists, not, not the table. So um, yeah. So we're gonna put that in there. And so now I have this Postgres and Redis uh, command. I'm going to, just for simplicity, I'm going to, oh boy. I'm going to add executable rights to my scripts here. And then I'm gonna back up. I'm gonna go in my Docker compose file. And I'm gonna set this up in here. This is what I do on almost every project is I first set up health checks because I want my apps to wait for my persistent storage. Now, something to point out here, this is not something you can really do in production. There's no such thing as a multi-server perfect wait for it script that, oh, you know, because that's distributed computing can't do that. But we have different mechanisms. We have retries, we have restarts, we have all these things in orchestration now that will manage that for us as long as we know the rules of how it works. But on your local machine, when you're locally developing and you're just spinning up something locally, you don't really want your app sitting there churning, 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 starting, 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 um, because that's just gonna eat up your CPU, make your fans run, you know, all that stuff. So we would like it to be a little cleaner when we are on a single machine, focused on development, right? So I'm going to add in a health check. And down here, but the first thing I need to do is I actually need to bind mount that health check in. So I'm going to bind mount in the health check. Directory. Into the container at health check. All right, pretty simple. Just gonna bind mount that directory. And then my command is going to be um, slash, nope, oh, yeah. What was it? Postgres.sh. Now, um, let's really quick, I think that works, because I think that will launch it in a shell. So we need this to launch in a shelf to get those environment variables. And I think that's what that will do. So here's the way we, we make sure that works. So in here, I'm just gonna do a Docker space compose space up of DB. So I'm just gonna start the DB real quick and see if it works. Um, Oh, did I do health checks? Did I pluralize that directory? Ah! All right. My path is wrong. Try it again. All right, now. I'm gonna run that in the background. So it launched, so we know at least it, it works and the specification's correct. 
So um, I'm going to launch that in the background with a dash D. So just the database in the background. And then I'm going to do a Docker Compose PS. Now, if I do a Docker dash Compose PS, this is an interesting thing. I, I'm not, I've not noticed this difference. All right, see how it says healthy? See that little healthy over there? That is the health check doing its job. Now, it looks like the new Docker Compose file, sorry, it looks like the new Docker Compose command doesn't specify the health state. So that's an, um, something that they need to work on and I can mention that to them. Uh, it's probably on their roadmap, but I can see that things are healthy. That now means that if I do a Docker Compose up of, let's see, let's see the result app, because that's, that one depends only on the database. It's gonna spin it up because the database is already available. And now we get, we're getting errors that are related to, there's no votes and it's um, because the table doesn't exist. And the table doesn't exist because the worker has to come up first. <laughs> so um, we'll work on that in a minute. But you're, you're, you're seeing hopefully my health check process. And now I need to do the same thing for Redis. Um, I'm going to skip that for now, but you would essentially do the same thing. You would bind mount in. I could even just do that same bind mount into Redis under volumes. And then I would need to specify a health check, very similar to this, right? And then this is going to be Redis. So that's how you do the health checks. Now, five seconds is probably a little, a little hot, a little too much. Um, the, the challenge with it is that when you first start this stuff up, it's going to wait for it to be healthy. So if you only do it every 30 seconds, then you're going you're gonna to have to wait at least 30 seconds before your apps start to, to start because they're going to wait 30 seconds before the first health, first health check on Redis and database before it even tries to start the containers for the rest of your app. So, you know, maybe 15 seconds. Um, for t this example today, I'm going to do, I'm going to do 10 or uh, five seconds because I, I just wanted to sit there uh, and be fast for demo. So now if I do a Docker Compose PS, I don't have anything running. So I'm going to do a Docker Compose up dash D, DB, Redis. So I'm just gonna bring up my database in Redis because I want them to stay in the background while I play with these other apps and troubleshoot them. So I'm gonna do Docker Compose up, and the backend service is called Worker. All right, so you see what it's doing? It's fatal password authentication. So that's because this app wasn't designed, the backend worker wasn't designed to, um, to use Postgres authentication originally. So that app needs to be modified to use a pa username and password when it's trying to authenticate. And then we need to put those passwords into environment variables, at least for Compose, that's what we would do. Um, and then we need to push that image because I'm not building locally yet, I'm only pulling the images. If you go inside of my Docker Compose file, you'll see that the worker, just like the other ones, they're all pulling from an image over on Docker Hub. In this example, I'm pulling it from Java. So the Java app ne needs to be, um, there's actually two implementations in this example of the worker. I technically have a .NET one and a Java one, and you can use either one, they do the same thing. But um, that, that needs to be updated. I think we updated that though, in the upstream repo. So let me go check that out. And before I do that, let me go check chat. We got any questions?
Uh, Emmanuel asks about, um, d- do the services in Kubernetes be HTTPS and, in- and insisting on that in the banking industry, insist this is a good practice. So it, I would say most organizations are not to that level of maturity. It's burdensome and tricky to make sure that every single thing in your clusters all has a certificate and that you know how to store them securely and that you know how to properly connect them to all the services and that the names are correct because sometimes the challenge is the names might be different on where, based on where things are coming from. So you might need a, a SAN certificate, a, a multiple name uh, certificate. And there's, there's lots of conditions there. So I would say by default, I do not do that. I do not recommend that when people are starting out because it, it ramps up the complexity, complexity a lot. It's only the front end services that are customer facing or externally service facing. And you, you better trust your networks inside your cluster. Now, does that mean that there's, there's cases where passwords might be going over the network between your servers and your data center in clear text? Yes, that's, that is what that means. Um, some people accept that risk and they trust the network they're on. They trust that it's protected physically, whether it's in the cloud or whatever, and they're fine with that. One thing you, you can do is you can, you, you're going to, if you do that, you're going to have to implement a certificate management solution. Uh, so you might look at cert manager for Kubernetes. That's still going to require you to either purchase certificates or figure out how to use Let's Encrypt automatically with all your services. That's still a problem you have to solve. Another way to do it that I see an increasing number of people doing when they get to the level of everything must be encrypted everywhere is you can either choose to do something like IPsec encryption at the network layer. So you're going to, you're going to put that in your network, uh, your CNI kind of stuff, and you're going to encrypt it at the host layer so that everything's encrypted. And then you don't necessarily have to encrypt each HTTP tunnel. Or I've seen people implement service mesh. So go check out service mesh. There are lots of products that do it, but essentially what service mesh does for you is is allows you to put a bunch of web services all over the place in different containers and then have better management and control over what's happening. So it improves several things. It, it, it improves your traffic awareness because you what it does is it actually injects proxies at every different step of the process. It puts proxies everywhere. Um, um, every container gets a proxy in a lot of cases. And in, in some of the designs, it's one proxy per server. In some, it's one proxy per, per pod. Uh, it just depends on which tool you're using. And what that does is it will start auto man- auto managing your TLS internally in the cluster, and it will create certificates for every one of these things and pass the traffic through them. Now, there's lots of reasons to use service mesh, but it's a very advanced tool. So most people would never want to implement that on their first Kubernetes project. It's quite a lot of work. So I don't teach it yet because it's still relatively new in the industry. It's not a requirement for most people to have server-to-server communications inside their clusters always be encrypted at the HTTP layer. But if you're in the banking industry, um, there's different regulations. There's different standards there. If they don't, if they don't want to standardize on IPsec, for example, then they're going to have to implement something like HTTPS. So yeah, I would imagine if you're a bank, everything's encrypted. I hope, right? Um, every connection is encrypted, whether it's a host-to-host or network, uh, you know, uh, application application, and all of them are mutually authenticated, right? And that in that case, in those scenarios, I would expect, you know, applications to only allow ex- connections from authorized other applications that are using certificate-based authentication. Most of us don't even know about that because there is such a thing as mutually authenticated client certificates. But you know, when you use a web browser, your, your, your client certificates are basically random. But uh, in highly secure environments, you know, certain APIs can only be contacted by endpoints that are speaking TLS and providing the correct client certificate so that both sides of the connection are, are authorizing the other side of the connection. They're authenticating and authorizing. Anyway, that's probably banking for you, but it's a totally different industry than what most of us are doing. So just because banking does it, doesn't mean we should be doing it, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's really hard to do, I think, for a new person, especially for like a single person to manage all that. It's just a lot. Um, you are most welcome, Peter. Or Peter? Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, 
You're most welcome. Uh, Iman is asking, is it better to just create a program? So it doesn't matter whether it's C or whatever. If you want to create a binary or some sort of tool, uh, I, there's, no, there's no real advantage, but you can make your health checks more complex, right? So for example, if you're writing a Python app, you might use Python to create a health check that goes deeper into inspecting the app. It might call specific APIs in that app or look at specific files on the hard drive or check permissions. It might just do all sorts of things as a part of the health check. But um, by and large, you want your health checks to be simple at first, and then you add complexity over time as you get more advanced in your learnings. Um, so typically we start out with simple, if it's a web server, just you know ping HTTP with a curl, like to just curl HTTP on the, the default URL or something. But over time, you, you will eventually have apps that have their own built-in health checks that have, for example, if they're an HTTP server, they will have something like slash health check. So that URL will kick off a bunch of functions in the app that will return a result. So the app itself can be health checked from anywhere, not just from Docker, but from one of your monitoring solutions. And that's that instrumentation inside your app is really important if you're a developer. Like that's the maturing of your application into a quality uh, app. So, all right, let's get back to the app. All right, so last we left this, um, I was, hey, I don't need to go there. Um, I was gonna need to change this thing so that it authenticated properly to the database since the database is gonna be authenticated. Let's go over and see. On. the official repo. Yeah, so uh, this is one way you can do it, by the way. If you're, you're dealing with Postgres, um, you can basically disable authentication. So, Uh, I'm gonna probably have to reply to that one and basically tell them thanks, but we're, we want to actually, actually we want to authenticate. That's a good example, right? If this is an example app, we want to authenticate. Uh, we don't want to disable authentication. Uh, so if I go over to the Java code, Yeah. All right, so this has already been fixed a year ago, but we've got old images. So that I think is our problem, is that we're using old images. Because if I go over here, I bet you, yeah, see it's two years old. So it needs to be updated. Bummer, I have not updated this app, that sucks. All right, so what we're gonna do is, is do that. And I am on the version list, so I'm going to I'm gonna stash the changes. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna use the GitHub app. And let's see. Compose. Let me make sure that I got this right. All right. Of 
We're going to go back to the master branch. And I'm going to merge upstream. And of course I have conflicts. Um. Oh, what's well, in result? Mm. Oh, right, because we added curl for health checks into the app. Um. Yeah, that works. Now, if I go into the worker and I go into Java, let's see, source. I think we should see the history. Yeah, that was all done in there. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the history, so, th so what we're gonna see now, if I go over to, Hub. Uh, go to Docker Hub and go to my own worker builds. Why are the builds not automating? Worker, 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 worker. I don't know why this didn't auto build. All right. So now we gotta wait on a Docker Hub to rebuild those images. We could just build them ourselves because we had the code. Um, you know, I could jump back over to my version list. And build the image locally. So, for example, and I could just name it the same thing, and then Docker Compose wouldn't know the difference. So, oh, I need to uns um, So we are, let's see, where were we? Sample voting app. And oops. There we go. Um, so in my Docker Compose, I've got this right here. All right, so I could just build that image manually, locally, and not wait for Docker Hub for now. So let me just quit out of that. 
then go into worker. So I'm going to do a Docker build. I'm going to have to specify a new files because I'm going to use the Docker file J. I'm going to tag it. Uh, oh, dot. So now we're building the Java image with the new password and username inside the code of the Java app. Leave it to Java to take a 50 line Java app <laughs> and take minutes to build. Um, but when that's done, all right, now we'll have a new image. and we should hopefully get better results. Oh, nope, I need to be in this directory. And now Docker Compose up. And we just wanna bring up the worker. Remember the database and the Redis are already running, right? I have them running uh, in the background with dash D. So there we go. Now the worker is up, it's connected successfully to Redis and to the database and it's watching for the queue, all right? It's watching for new vote. So I'm gonna put it into daemon mode. So I'm gonna do an up dash D. And come on, you can do it. There it goes. All right, now we're gonna try and do Docker Compose up. And this is the back end, the result app. Uh, what does it say here? What does it say? No such service worker. Hmm. I want to, I want to do the, my version of this image because I'm not sure how up to date the other one is. So, oh, I don't have the condition healthy up here. So for this one, it depends on Redis and I didn't update this part. So that's there. Vote and result. So I've got the Redis, the DB. Yep. All right, so now we need to go to front end. Well, let's try that again. Docker compose up results. What is happening? I'm going to restart over. Acting weird. Uh... 
Am I typing two different commands? No. Found orphan containers. Yeah, I don't know why it's saying that. Attaching to example. Let's just see what happens when I do the whole thing. All right, so it looks like the result app also is not updated. And we're pulling images. Yeah, these images are still building. And then uh, I'm gonna go back over to my repositories and see if the result app, um, by the way, if you have any questions about what I'm doing, throw them in chat. All right, so this um, result app, three years ago, six months ago, So what I'm trying to do is manually get, you know, for some reason these things aren't kicking off when I, I push to GitHub. So if I go back to my repo, it should have. I merged upstream master 12 minutes ago. And some reason GitHub is not. Either GitHub's not sending the webhooks or Docker Hub is not getting them. That's right, these are building. I'm not sure this is correct. Yeah, uh, they should be a little bit more correct now. So that is the three par the parts of worker, 
result, and then I need the third one, which is the voting app. Last push nine minutes ago. So it that one looks like it auto built. Build caching. What we want to do is we want to wait on these to finish to see if they're going to be successful. Now I could always build them locally and just push them to Docker Hub, but I would prefer a much more CI CD uh, cloud friendly method, right? Uh, even if I'm an individual developer, I really don't want to be building and pushing my images on my own. Like that's maybe what I would build locally when I'm customizing things. But ideally, I just want to work on my code locally, then ship it and let some other CI system, you know, build my images and store them in a registry. And that's and that's what I'm waiting on, right? We could always do this locally. The result app looks like it's doing this failed authentication. So let's go see if the upstream has fixed that problem. The upstream example voting app, let's go under result and 12, 11, three. Result app. There's a .NET version. Yeah, so in here we set an explicit Postgres Postgres. Now the problem here is that these are not, these are hard coded, which again bad for an example should not be set hard coded. Um, that's just not. I don't like doing that. And I would rather fix that. Um, I know examples are supposed to be simple, but a lot of people will take examples and 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 you know uh, they'll take it a little too far. Like sometimes an example is just to focus on a specific problem set, and then people look at it and and think that it's trying to indicate some other fact thing that you're supposed to be doing. But in fact, that thing is actually not a part of the example, right? Because at some point the example has to stop that it can't you can't just have an example app that is everything to everyone for the perfect solution of an app like that's a really really big project so in this original example app it was really more about how to spin up multiple containers on different networks and then how to um update those apps and how it would do updates and that kind of thing simple stuff it was more about the docker commands than it was about how to write a proper app <laughs> So the problem is that some people are looking at these examples and going, oh, I should just store my passwords in the in the code and, and I never have to worry about it. Because reality is on day one, when you first create your first app, you're going to have to put in environment variables and set usernames and passwords. Like that's just normal. So I would expect us to always do that in our sample apps. But, you know, this app is like four years old. So it maybe wasn't... The, the way back then when when back then when MySQL, Postgres, Redis, all the things all worked without passwords in containers for simplicity. And then they realized that people were not changing the passwords because if security is not default, people will skip it. So uh, they've le all learned their lessons now. And the only one left, I think, is Redis. I think Redis is one of the few left that still doesn't require a password by default, which I also still think should be changed. Uh, so that it requires a password. 
And then that means all of our examples will be forced to get updated to show how you do usernames and passwords in Docker, like how you should do it. Environment variables or config maps, one of the two. All right, builders, come on, taking forever. So on my local, let's see, um, if that password was updated properly, then I could also do the same thing for my result app. So I could build this Docker file. Now, the reason I can't use a Docker compose build is because I didn't specify the build information in the compose file. I only have it using the images. So in order to build, you would actually have to have a build section in your compose file, which I, I took out for the simplicity of this example. Um, but this one is gonna be result. It's just gonna use the regular Docker file. And that'll take a minute as well. So I'm building both locally and in the cloud. All right. Uh, I got it. I'm in the wrong directory. Okay. So yeah, if I if the apps are updated, then everything works. So if I take this back and I just do a duck and compose up. You see the Redis came up and DB came up first. It waited for health checks to pass. Then it's starting to start the other apps now. So now it's starting result and worker and voting, hopefully. Not seeing any logs from the other ones. I'm going to switch terminals and oh, this is example. All right, so it's only I don't know why those three, only those three are running. Worker Redis vote. Vote Redis worker result. So they're, all, that's very weird. They're all there. I'm thinking, what I'm thinking I'm running into is I think I'm running into bugs with the new Docker Compose up. <laughs> so I'm going to switch back to the old one um, for now. Because I'm tired of troubleshooting their bugs. It should just work. The fact that I thought it was a bug was because the results between two different tabs for the Docker Compose commands were different. It was actually showing me over here only three services, even though it started all five. So I don't know what was happening.
Ooh, okay, there we go. We're getting unhealthy. So let's go and, okay, so the redis is unhealthy. Now, what we can do, this is, this is troubleshooting a health check. How you troubleshoot a health check is that you go look at your compose file and we can just bat out that Docker compose file. Bat is a utility that colorizes a file format in the terminal instead of cat. It's called bat, B-A-T, go check it out. Um, and for Redis, I'm doing this health check and let's see why it might not be working. So I can run that by just going into the container and manually running that command. So I can just do a docker compose exec in Redis and call it, I'm gonna do ash because that's the terminal, that's the shell in an Alpine command. Oh, right, we don't have, right, I have to use the dash. Sorry, there's no exec in the new companion command yet. All right, health check. Oh. Oh, that's why, okay. So, um, you know what it is? It's my shell script. Because that is an Alpine image, um, the health check needs to use the proper shell. So what I could maybe do, let me see if this works. Instead of changing the, the, the script, if I just, well, actually I wanna change the script. Um, let's see, health check. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm, I'm gonna change it from bash to sh. See if that helps. I'm not sure if it needs bash necessarily. And then I also need to fix that inconsistency. Because down here I have health checks going to health check. And that's not what I want. And then down here, Health checks, so it's consistent. I could compose up DB, will actually bring it down, and then I think it'll bring it down, then bring it back up. Oh, and I forgot to do a dash D. So let's do Docker compose up. dash D, DB, and Redis. All right, now um, it's still starting Redis, so we're gonna give it a second, but I'm just gonna hit the up arrow and keep watching the PS until, okay, still got it unhealthy. All right, so I'm gonna do that same thing again. I'm gonna exec back into that container with Ash, and then I'm gonna do a health check. I have a dot in there. That's what my problem is. And it's plural. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So if I do it in here, I bet you it'll work. Yeah, yeah, that's my problem.
So take that out. So it's going to start those over again because I changed something in the bind mount. And the bind mount, uh, the only way you can change that is for it to kill the container, delete it, and recreate it. Okay. Now let's do the, the PS command again, see our status. Look at that. We're finally healthy. All right. I don't suck so much as I used to suck five minutes ago. All right, so now um, now that those are healthy, then other ones can start. That was probably part of the problem. Um, so if I do up now, it's gonna bring up the rest of the stuff, result, the worker, the voter, and we should start seeing connections. So the result says connected to DB, the worker says connected to Redis and DB. Um, the worker is waiting for a vote and, um, yeah. Okay. So let's go, let's go try it. Localhost 5,000. All right. I'm going to, of course, vote for dogs. And then I can go to localhost 5001 and see that 100% of the votes are for dogs. Now, over the years, I have actually developed a little script using Apache Bench AB tool that will feed this thing a ton of votes. Um, it uses an HTTP command. So if you've ever heard of Apache Bench, it's a little project that is a command line tool that allows you to basically stress test a web server. So imagine if you took like a single curl command and you could add all the headers you want, all the payload you want, and then you can just run it, a, you know, 5,000 times and it'll run it as fast as you want it to. And that's what Apache Bench is. And it'll, it'll give you all sorts of stats back. So it's great for benchmarking but also it's useful for just seeding a bunch of simple data through an API. If you need to seed a database by throwing a bunch of, you know, or test an application by throwing at a bunch of data in a put command, um, this is how you could do it. And I've done that in my app. So you can see here that we've processed the vote. So I, I voted in the voter, I voted for B, um, for some reason, it repeated that. Not sure why. Uh, and then the worker processed it. And there we go. All right. What is next? Well, I've, I've definitely determined here that there are some quirks with the new Docker Compose up that I need to, to run down and then file issues. Um, and it might be because the version I have might not be the latest because Docker has this CLI. Where's that at? There we go. Um, and What's the release? So the 16 days ago, 107. Um, and what are they? We got tons of issues here. What? Let's find some bugs. Yeah, let me search here for health check. Uh, 
Um, update health check docs. Yeah, there's nothing really here. So I wonder if I go back to just, let's see. So we, we are here. I'm going to stop all those. And it's going to shut things down gracefully. It looks like the result is not shutting down gracefully. Yeah, that took forever. Um, so if I do a Docker space compose up, Okay, so now all five of them are working. So I think the core issue I was having is that the health checks were working, but they were failing. There was no way for me to tell they were failing in the new version of the Compose command line. Um, so the other ones weren't starting. In fact, the PS command is a little different. It doesn't even list services that aren't running. So um, yeah. Definitely need to add that. And I don't see that in zero open. So there's no open tickets for health checks. Gonna have to file a ticket on that. All right. Um, but I think I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. So there's a lot I'm gonna, more I'm going to do with this app. I'm, um, I'm going to need, I, so I need to update Docker's images and get those working again because I have my own images here, example voting app, but, I, but you know, there's the official Docker ones that everyone is really using and those aren't up, as up to date. So I need to fix those. Let's actually go look at those. Um, let's go over to repositories and Docker samples. All right. So I'm going to I think mine are good. We know it works locally. So let's go look at what's the deal with the ones here. Actually, we could probably do. And I can do a prune. Docker system prune, clean everything out, delete all the stuff. Start from scratch. Make sure we got no containers running. Make sure we got no images. And I'm gonna do a Docker Compose pull. And you notice how it's pulling all the images in parallel? Isn't that pretty cool? Uh, it, with the old Docker Compose, it would pull them uh, separate one at a time like it, it might do multiple layers at a time but it certainly wouldn't pull multiple different images at a time so we get a lot more parallelism out of the box with the new docker compose all right now um so this is what's interesting so this result one so see how it says now created 20 minutes ago so that it actually knows how old the image is on docker hub and then that one, but this uh, this result latest is still two years ago. So it looks like that one has still not been updated. It must still be building. Let me go look. That was result, right? Yeah. Hmm.
I thought we built it. I thought we reconfigured and built. By the way, if you're making your own apps and you're just playing around, you you know to keep yours automatically secure, you can enable the base image. So this what this does is that means that every if you're if you're not pinning versions, which you should totally pin versions, but if it's just a de demo or something like what I'm doing, uh, if you just enable the base image thing there, which I should be doing. Um, well, that's weird. Why isn't it not? That's a Docker sample. I want to go to mine. Result. What well, says updated? Hmm. Master latest. Ooh, failed. Hmm. Why did it fail? Uh, APK update, APK add, no cache curl. Okay, is the code wrong on that? Oh. Wait. It's a result, right? Master result. Oh, I'm not on the master branch. Um. Let me go over to the master branch, leave my changes. Yes. And then, that was dumb. So, I think what needs to be added here, is and of course you got to go get the official um I have to get install syntax Yeah, so you put that at the bottom. Oops. And then ideally you're putting in no recommends. Now you could do that. It's only one. So I'm adding curl. And um,
All right, so now what that's going to do is that should over here in, not in the Docker samples, yeah, over here in mine, that should kick off a new build. So, yeah. All right, where are we at? So these are not quite as updated. So basically when I pull the images, it still fails, which is not what I want. That's not ideal. And we're waiting, we're waiting. All right, so while we're doing that, one of the other things was, we gotta figure out why the Docker samples aren't updated. I mean, they haven't been updated in two years. That's crazy, they're broke. They're totally broke. We've gotta fix them. So, going over to builds. Oh, now I remember why this was a problem. I got to link them to GitHub with a special account. Okay, now I know what I gotta do. So um, when you're in a team and you're on GitHub and Docker Hub and you want Docker Hub to build your images, you need to link them together. But it uses a GitHub account to do that. And you probably don't wanna use your account because what if you leave, right? What if you have access to other ones that you don't want Docker Hub to have access to, other, other repos? So you really need a bot account. and you need that probably, you will probably need that bot account on Docker Hub as well as on GitHub. You'll need it probably on, you'll need on GitHub to link these two. So you need a GitHub bot account that has access to only the repos that you want Docker Hub to have access to. And then secondly, you'll need a bot account on Docker Hub because you'll probably need to push and pull things from your CI solution, your CD solution, and you probably don't want to use your account for that either. So you'll need robots in both places. Uh, in this case, I needed to create a GitHub account um, and I'm not going to do that <laughs> live streaming. Uh, that seems risky and tedious. It sounds very boring. And in fact, I don't even know if I want to do it today. So what we're, what we're left with is that these, what's happened is these official images need to get auto built, but I need to go to, in order to fix them and get Docker hub building them, I need to go create a GitHub account and give it then permissions to the organization where all these GitHub repos live. Then I can come in here into builds and click link to GitHub, get access to only those, those ones that I need access to, only those repos. And then I can enable auto builds so that every time, just like in my personal ones, every time a specific branch or a specific thing gets updated, a webhook comes from GitHub and tells Docker Hub to auto build my images like it's doing now, but we're pending, we're pending. Let me refresh. In progress. Let's go look at the in progress. Logs are not available yet. Let's make sure the Docker file is indeed correct. Okay. So not available? Come on, Hub, you can do it. I know you're busy. Oh, well. Well, instead of sitting around and waiting for this thing to finish build, I am, um, I'm going to leave. Um, all right. Thanks everybody for joining. I'm going to check out. So I will be here live next week, YouTube live. We'll not sure what we're going to talk about on next Thursday, but you can support and follow me over on Patreon. 
So go to patreon.com slash Brett Fisher. And you can follow me for free. Or if you'd like to buy me a coffee and get some exclusive benefits, feel free. You can do that over there. That's how you know about all my latest stuff, what I'm updating, what I'm running, um, you know, what, what, what rele- new content I'm releasing. Uh, I did a new article recently from Udemy uh, on the Docker versus Kubernetes, and it gave you the whole breakdown of Docker versus Kubernetes and like where the history is, what the innovations of Docker are, why Kubernetes is needed, what's the future. Um, you can look that up. Udemy, Docker versus Kubernetes. So I spent way too much time on that article over on their blog. Oh, site blog.udemy.com. So I call it the full guide because it's like 2,000 words and it's a lot of stuff. But uh, I'm going to totally give you that link. And I bid you adieu. Thanks for watching. I uh, hope you learned a little bit something about the workflow of Kubernetes, of Kubernetes Compose and uh, how I use it and how I in- inject health checks into there, how I bring things up one at a time, all that stuff. And if this is valuable to you, let me know with a thumbs up and comments, whether it's in comments and chat or comments. Like, let me know if you want to see more of this sort of live streaming while I'm working on some open source project kind of thing. It's it's long and tedious, but sometimes just watching someone work it reveals insights. Um, I don't know if that's valuable. If you want like one live show a month from me that that is in this kind of world where I'm I'm just going to work on a project that it's not so much usually development, although there might be a little bit of that. It's mostly about configuring Compose and Docker properly, getting things to work properly in containers, uh, maybe building out more complex Docker files. But it needs to be on real-world projects, right? Or, or real-world example projects or something that's uh, functional. Because I'm not going to sit here and write code from scratch and implement a brand new project. That's just way too much work for me. So uh, tell me what you think. Let me know in chat, in the comments below. I'll see you next week here on YouTube Live. Ciao, everybody.